Let's talk about America's constant betrayal against those called Black Americans. Black Americans, are you beyond tired yet? I'll be back. I want to revisit Dred Scott, the infamous Dred Scott case where Dred Scott and Harriet Scott petitioned the court to gain their freedom, but it was denied. So I'm just if you look at the history of, of black Americans and citizenship, black Americans went through hell to be considered citizens of this country. Citizenship has been reduced to nothing the way they're just handing it out. I mean, hey, these people, you know, they want a better life and they this, you know, they got all kind of reasons and excuses as to why illegals who have no roots in this country should be given the gift of American citizenship. But they had a completely, totally different attitude when it comes to those or came to those who have strong roots in this country strong roots built this country and yet white races fought tooth and nail to deny those called black americans something as simple and natural as citizenship so let's get into this on the morning of march the 6th 1857 chief justice taney read aloud the 72 majority opinion in Dred Scott versus Sanford. The Scots were not and never could be American citizens. The court held and therefore had no right to sue the federal court. They would remain enslaved. The court's decision denied citizenship to all black people in America, to the 4 million enslaved men and women and children whose back breaking unpaid labor powered the nation's economy as well as to the several hundred thousand black people who were free. My question is, can someone answer this? Since those called black Americans were given such an unbelievably hard time demanding citizenship and getting it, why have some made it so easy for illegal immigrants to retain citizenship? answer that question Let's talk about america's constant betrayal of those called black americans you know why it keeps happening black americans because you allow it to missouri's dred scott case 1846 through 1857 this man fought that long in its 1857 decision that stunned the nation, the United States Supreme Court, upheld slavery in the United States territories, denied the legalities of black citizenship in America, and declared the Missouri Compromise to be unconstitutional. Yep, this happened in America. So uh, you, you see how uh, it's funny how some people want to just totally ignore how and then it wasn't individuals just admitted in individual white citizens perpetuating slavery and racism or perpetuating racism and biasness and bigotedness it was the federal government who helped perpetuate racism in this country against those called black americans now when you keep re uh, bucking up against reparations you better go to the government and ask them why the hell they kept perpetuating racism against us, which encouraged regular citizens to perpetuate racism against us. You see how that worked out? Let's continue. Dred Scott and his wife, Harriet Robinson Scott, 
thought they had a chance at freedom. Their enslavers had taken them to free states or territories where slavery was outlawed. Other enslaved people had won so-called freedom suits in St. Louis courts thanks to Missouri's doctrine of once free, always free. But this country's Supreme Court deemed Missouri's compromise unconstitutional. As I said, those called black Americans and those people warped minds weren't, suppo weren't supposed to be free. Free from physical bondage. So... They wickedly found ways to put black folks back in chains mentally, spiritually, financially, and physically. Mass incarceration is the physical bondage. Poverty, lack of jobs, lack of opportunities is physical bondage and financial bondage. We won't even get into the mental and spiritual. I don't even know. You know, I'll probably reserve that for the podcast that... um. It will be soon erected. Let's go on. America has consistently denied black American citizenship, even though it was a violation of their own constitution and beyond the constitution that they treat as a simple piece of paper when they want to. But the right to exist and live in peace is an inalienable right that black folks have been denied. That man does not have the right on this earth to give or take away. No man, woman, or child has any right on this earth to give someone's freedom or take it away. They really don't. Mr. Scott suffered from tuberculosis, and at close to 50, he was considered old, especially for an enslaved person. Harriet Scott was in her late 20s. The couple had two small children, Eliza and Lizzie. Two sons had died in infancy. Black families were at the mercy of enslavers who routinely sold and separated family members. Mr. Scott's first wife had been sold away and sent to a plantation in Arkansas. In its 1857 decision that stunned the nation, the United States Supreme Court upheld slavery in the United States territory, denied the legality of black citizenship in America, and declared the Missouri Compromise to be unconstitutional. All of this was the result of an April 1846 action when Dred Scott innocently made his mark with an X signing his petition in a pro forma freedom suit initiated under Missouri law to sue for freedom desiring freedom his case instead became the lightning rod for sectional bitterness and hostility that was only resolved by war stop lying and saying the civil war didn't have anything to do with slavery you guys try so hard to diminish what happened in this country due to those called black americans that's how small you feel you want to you want to feel so great by trying to diminish what our people contributed to this country. Your lies are coming apart right in your face. Initially, Scott's case for freedom was routine and, and relatively insignificant like hundreds of others that passed through the St. Louis Circuit Court. The cases were allowed because a Missouri statute stated that any person, black or white, held in wrongful enslavement could sue for freedom. The petition that Dred Scott signed indicated the reasons he felt he was entitled to freedom. Scott's owner, Dr. John Emerson, was a United States Army surgeon who traveled to various military posts in the free state of Illinois and the free Wisconsin Territory. Dred Scott traveled with him and therefore resided in areas where slavery was outlawed because of missouri's long-standing once free always free judicial standard in determining freedom suits slaves who were taken to such areas were freed even if they returned to the slave state of missouri once the bonds of slavery were broken they did not reattach Dred Scott was born to slave parents in Virginia sometime around the turn of the 19th century. His parents may have been the property of Peter Blow, or Blow may have purchased Scott 
a later at a later date. The mystery of exact ownership is one that would follow Dred Scott and later his family throughout their lives as slaves. On June 23, 1832, Peter Blow passed away. And slavers' deaths sometimes resulted in children being sold away from black families at estate sales. Mr. Scott tried to buy his family's freedom, but the widow turned him down. And slavers often retaliated against people who filed lawsuits, but researchers have unearthed records of 300 freedom suits, including the Scots. More than 100 plaintiffs succeeded in winning their freedom. If you think about it, 1814 to 1860, that wasn't, that was a long time to only have had 300 suits filed in the court. You got to wonder where they the slaves scared and knew the repercussions of being so bold as to try to fight for their freedom or you know some were um illiterate didn't know how to do it you know you gotta wonder why it was so little suits filed within that time frame that was like what a little over 40 years 40 years only 300 people filed for freedom cases for freedom let's continue those who risk violent reprisals and separation from their loved ones to sue for their freedom should be celebrated as america's first civil rights litigants historian david thomas said that's sick because you want a freedom from a barbaric individual they made your life harder. You see, you see, don't you see the comparisons from that period to now? You don't see the the uh, retaliation when you dare to confront them and and demand your rights. You don't see retaliate retaliations. Let's let's ooh, let's go on. Charlotte Taylor Blow married Joseph. Charles Jr. in November 1831, his father had established the first newspaper west of the Mississippi River and had been a leading opponent of slavery while editor. Charles Jr. operated a wholesale drug and paint store, Charles and Company. Later, Charles Blow and Company, when brothers-in-law Henry Taylor Blow and Taylor Blow became partners, Martha Ella Blow married attorney Charles Drake in 1835. Drake is better known in history for his role in the creation of Missouri's 1865 Constitution. As a leader of the Radical Republican Party after the Civil War, he was determined to punish those considered southern sympathizers the constitution he helped author took away many of their rights including enfranchisement peter blow married eugenia in 1833 she was from an old french banking family her oldest brother was a wealthy businessman who in partnership with blow formed peter e blow and company she had two other brothers. One was the St. Louis County Sheriff for a time in the 1840s, and one, Charles Edmund LaBamey, was a St. Louis attorney who played an important role in Dred Scott's freedom suits. All of these St. Louis connections proved helpful to Dred Scott. Do you see how these people were allowed to build wealth undisturbed? Imagine if the times that our people built successful, prosperous communities throughout this country, if they weren't disturbed. We'd probably be richer than them, and they knew it. They knew it. They know it's something supernaturally powered, powerful attached to us. All the things they have done against us throughout the years and centuries, and we still hear, they know it's something supernaturally powerful about us. That's why surrounding us, covering us, that's why they work so hard to try to keep us oppressed. But we always break through. Always. 
And watch when them tables turn. Watch when you start seeing them in the physical. Do not sit there and cry and beg for mercy. Do not do it. Because when it comes to mercy, y'all don't know what mercy means. Most of you guys don't know what mercy means. I'll be fair. Let's continue. On April the 6th, 1846, Dredd and Harriet Scott each filed separate petitions and suits against Irene Emerson to obtain their freedom from slavery. These documents, identical in nature, stated that the petitioners were entitled to their freedom based on residences in the free state of Illinois, Rock Island, and the free Wisconsin Territory, Fort Snelling. The suits were brought under a Missouri statute that specifically allowed anyone held wrongfully in slavery to sue for their freedom. Specific procedures for filing suit were outlined in the statute. First, a petition to sue was filed in the circuit court. If the petition contained sufficient evidence that the plaintiff was being wrongfully held, the judge ordered that the petitioner be allowed to sue security for all court costs that might be a judge had to be presented to the court the judge would also order that the petitioner have liberty to attend to counsel in court and not be removed from the jurisdiction of the court or subjugated to any severe punishment because of the freedom suit although pro-slavery and sentiment judge john m crom approved the form of the petition which dread and harriet scott signed with their marks an x and granted them permission to sue the scott's case moved slowly through the legal system reaching the u.s supreme court in 1856 most of the justices were families that enslaved people. Chief Justice Roger Taney, the son of wealthy Maryland tobacco planters, had emancipated the enslaved people he had inherited, but he remained at 80 a staunch defender of white supremacy and was Andrew Jackson, the president who had put him on the court. By one account, you see, you see, did y'all catch that? Andrew Jackson, and he was a horrific man. And then Taney was another horrific man. That, see, that's where we talk about systemic racism. It's ingrained in the systems in this country. Friends of friends and friends who had the same philosophy and same mentality would appoint people to be in positions under them serve with them serve under them let's continue you know what i'm so tired of emphasizing this and 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 expounding on what systemic racism is the people who are denying it they know what it is and they know it exists and they know it continues to exist so i'm not going to continue to play this game with you i'm not let's go on by one account Justice Samuel Nielsen's tuition at Middlebury College was financed in part by his father selling an enslaved girl. This man, this man went to college and it was financed by selling a person who most likely looked like me. Let's continue. On the morning of March 6, 1857, Chief Justice Taney read out loud the 72 majority opinion in Dred Scott versus Sanford. The Scots were not and could never be American citizens. That's what the court said. They would remain enslaved. The court's decision denied citizenship to every black person in America. And including the free black folks. The court's ruling validated the doctrine of racial difference and hierarchy that had been used to justify racialized slavery and continues to haunt our nation today. The court described black people as being of an inferior order and concluded that black people are altogether unfit to associate with the white race either in social or political relations the court also found that black people are so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and you gonna sit here and tell me that that mentality doesn't exist today 
How many people convince themselves to believe that that mentality does not persist today? The court viewed the principle in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal through the lens of white supremacy. Those words would seem to embrace the whole human family. The court acknowledged, however, it is too clear for dispute that no one had ever intended such equality to apply to black people, enslaved or free. By the common consent of all civilized governments and the family of nations, the court said the Negro race had been doomed to slavery. What I, what I've been saying. What have I been saying throughout the duration of the videos that I have published on this channel? Haven't I said that? Haven't I said that it was intended that black folks never got out of slavery? Never. And that's why they treat you the way they treat you. Because they never, ever intended for you to be free. And they act like that. Black folks, I'm telling you. This is some strong, demonic forces at work. And you can laugh it off and brush it off if you want to. But if you look at the history, if it was man, if it was just simple man doing this, they would have been broken down a long time ago. Because we're very resilient and we're very strong people. But this is beyond man. They are giving, they are giving directions from the devil on how to keep you oppressed and it's spiritual they are involved in witchcraft that's how they keep you oppressed that's how they keep you confused that's how they keep you chasing your tail like a confused dog it's witchcraft involved in this and if you don't turn back to god and cry out to him you are doomed real talk you are let's continue the court could have limited its judgment to the Scots quest for citizenship. Instead, the court broadened the ruling to address the bitterly contested question of slavery in the territories. In 1820, Congress had enacted the Missouri Compromise, which banned slavery in territories north of the Missouri state line. Mr. Scott's case was based largely on his enslaver having taken him to Fort Snelling, which was located in free territory that is now Minnesota. But the court held that Mr. Scott was property and the Constitution does not allow the government to deprive a citizen of property without due process of law. With this reasoning, the court ruled against Mr. Scott and legalized slavery in the territories by overturning the Missouri Compromise. It was only the second time the court had overturned an act of Congress. Again, black folks, you can't fight this by... What is this, uh, Ephesians, the full armor? Our fight is not with flesh and blood. You guys can keep denying the Bible. It's the white man's religion. Keep on doing that and keep seeing yourself stuck. That's why you're going to continue to be stuck. Because the Bible is our history. And it's tools that God gave us to fight this demonic oppression that's been over you for over 400 years. That's why it's been over you. Well, you know, we had to go through it. We did. It's, a, it's an appointed time. But the time is coming to an end. You're going to have to make a choice. You're going to keep trying to go out there and do your own thing and continue to be stuck are you gonna run to your god it's up to you you can be stuck all day long if you want to i'm not gonna be stuck and i'm not stuck that's why i speak with so much boldness and confidence because it comes from god it comes from christ jesus this boldness done ain't in me it came from god and when you don't have that confidence, that foundation, God, you're going to be a cowardice and you're going to be like a dog chasing your tail and scared of your own shadow. Yes, you will, because I've seen it throughout my walk. I have. And what I say on these videos, trust, it has been said in people's faces, whether physically in their face, through emails, phone calls. I already told you in, in some other videos, I did this. I wrote letters to politicians and public leaders i did this okay let's continue 
Amid escalating national tensions over slavery, Dred Scott's obscure freedom suit took on monumental significance. Newly elected President James Buchanan had pressured Associate Justice and fellow Pennsylvanian Robert Gere, Robert Greer to persuade other members of the court to broaden the ruling in favor of expanding slavery. Wow. In his address on March the 4th, 1857, Mr. Buchanan, knowing how the court was about to rule, predicted that the decision would settle the slavery question and that the country would be most happy with the ruling. <laughs> Ooh. They was happy to oppress black folks. Ain't that sick? People are happy with your oppression. You think they still ain't happy with oppression? Let's continue. Justice Benjamin Curtis from Massachusetts wrote a stinging dissent and resigned from the court shortly afterward, reporting in part because of the decision. Abraham Lincoln, then a candidate, for a U.S. Senate from Illinois said the court had turned the Declaration of Independence into a mango ruin. The court had lost all moral authority, historian Eric Fauner said, at least in the northern half of the country. In the spring of 1857, said historian David Blight, to be black in America was to live in the land of the Dred Scott decision, which in effect said, you have no future in America. And they still feel that same way today. They just learn how to make money off you, but you still they still oppress you in some kind of way. Even rich black folks are still oppressed in some kind of way. Unless you're bowing down to, you know, boule. Let's continue. Taney's opinion of the court stated that Negroes were not citizens of the United States and had no right to bring suit in a federal court. In addition, Dred Scott had not become a free man as a result of his residence at Fort Snelling because the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. Congress had no authority to prohibit slavery in the federal territories. According to Taney's opinion, Black folks were beings of an inferior order, so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. And you know what I'm saying with that regard? What I'm going to say to that nonsense he spewed out of his raggedy mouth? Your skin tone tells me where you belong on the ladder. You could take it. You could take what I said whatever way you want to. Your skin tone speaks loudly to me and the world. Let's continue. Oh, by the way, the sun doesn't hate my skin color. You got what I said. Let's go. Dred Scott tried to win his freedom at a time when white Americans were struggling to determine the political status of slavery, as well as their attitudes towards black people, slave or free. He was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. The United States Supreme Court's pro-slavery pro decision did not surprise the nation. In fact, it outraged much of the population when it was confirmed. Black leaders who were already risking their lives to resist slavery and advocate for equality voiced their outrage at the court in editorials and speeches. A month after the decision, hundreds of black people gathered at the Israel Church in Philadelphia four blocks from Independence Hall to draft protest resolution. Charles Raymond declared that his grandfather had fought for this country in a revolutionary war. Now that same country grinds us under its iron hoof and treats us like dogs, he said. Reporting on the Philadelphia meeting in the provincial freeman Mary Ann Shad Carey, a black abolitionist who had moved to Canada, implored Mr. Raymond and other leaders, Your national ship is rotten, sinking. Why not leave that slavery cursed republic? Robert Purvis, a black leader who was active in the Underground Railroad, 
said that Dred Scott meant the government had deliberately before the world declare one part of its people disenfranchised and outlawed. Frederick Douglass declared that this infamous decision of the slaveholding wing of the Supreme Court maintains that slaves are property in the same sense that horses, sheep, and swine are property. The court's thundering denial of the humanity of black people drove Mr. Douglass into a depression. Historian David Blight wrote, and yet he kept giving the electrifying speeches about the promised future of black people as free and equal Americans. The justice did not have the last word. Mr. Douglass declared God did. The court had made America awake to the slavery question at last he said my hopes were never brighter than now mr douglas former north star co-editor martin delaney who had been admitted to harvard medical school but was forced out after white students complained respond oh jesus let's continue responded to dress scott in the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 by writing a novel whose hero escaped bondage and and plots and overthrow of slavery. The novel was serially published in the Angelo African Magazine in 1859. The man was admitted into Harvard Medical School but forced out after white students complained. You know the, the short that I did about the uh, the what is it magical world of magical Negroes, and um, the character says that well, who is the dangerous, most dangerous creature on the face of the earth? And he said a white person uncomfortable. You see how they basically ruined that man's dream of being a doctor because they were uncomfortable. Did not ask in the beginning of the short. Where's the lie? When white folks get uncomfortable. Or feel like they have a right to ruin your life. They do it without any repercussions. Let's continue. Well, repercussion for man. But trust, these folks that participated, that participated in the demise of those called black Americans and on whatever level, they they, 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 they pay the price. Yeah. One day they're going to come out and start admitting how their lives turned out when they did black folks wrong. Mm-hmm. Especially the ones that murdered him without a conscience. Let's continue. The role of the Supreme Court in legitimizing slavery and embedding the narrative of, of racial hierarchy in the legal system long predated Dred Scott and continued long after. In 1842, Margaret Morgan and her six children were seized from their beds in Philadelphia in the middle of the night by Maryland lawyer Edward Prigg and three other white men loaded into an open wagon and taken forcibly south to Maryland where slavery was legal. Miss Morgan had been born in Maryland where her mother had been enslaved, but the will of her mother's long deceased enslaver seemed to free Margaret Morgan. She married a free black man from Phil- from Pennsylvania and in 1832 she moved to Philadelphia. They did not consider themselves fugitives, but the descendants of the man who enslaved Miss Morgan's mother hired Mr. Prague to return Miss Morgan and her children to Maryland. Oh, sometimes I want to, I wish I could just, I'm going to say that for the podcast. Let's go. Mr. Prague and the other man who kidnapped and trafficked Miss Morgan and her children to Maryland were convicted of violating a Pennsylvania law that barred profiteering kidnappers from capturing black people and turning them over to enslavers or auctioneers. But in an eight to one vote, the Supreme Court struck down that law as unconstitutional. The court's opinion pointed to the constitution section enabling slavery to retrieve fugitives from bondage. In the separate opinion in Prigg versus Pennsylvania, Chief Justice Taney said anyone who prevented enslavers from forcing people back into bondage was a wrongdoer, and any state law that interfered was null and void. 
Prigg was one of several cases in the 1840s and 50s where the Taney Court upheld so-called fugitive slave laws designed to aid enslavers. As Andrew Jackson's attorney general, Mr. Taney, had written in 1832 that black Americans were a degraded class and any rights they enjoyed were because of white Americans' benevolence. Oh, my God. Ooh, these people. These people. These people have the mind of believing that they are God. And you can't tell them they ain't. Yep, I said it like that. And you can't tell them they ain't. Let's continue. Margaret Morgan and her children disappeared into bondage. Mr. Prigg, who went unpunished along with his accomplice, became a sheriff. He got rewarded. Don't you still see the, the pattern of that today? Shoot an unarmed black person. They dead. They are dead. And then that man or woman goes on and, and climbs a ladder and has a prosperous career. Let's continue. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments enacted between 1865 and 1869 effectively reversed Dred Scott by abolishing slavery, except as punishment for crimes. They said, yeah, we're going to act civilized. We don't want the world to think that we're all barbaric. So we're going to abolish slavery, but we're going to let you put people back in slavery by arresting them and sending them to prison. They were like, wow, that was great, Brett. That was great, Alexander. Great idea. Let's continue. Extending citizenship rights to black Americans, including the right to vote for black men and guaranteeing them equal protection of law. But even as Dred Scott was overturned, white supremacy was not. White people organized a brutal resistance against black citizenship, deploying violence and terror to crush Reconstruction. In response, Congress passed a series of enforcement acts in 1870 and 1871 the broadest being the KKK Act of 1871, Southern white leaders called the act an unjustified federal intrusion of state authority. Adopting the Southern view, the Supreme Court issued opinions that severely undermine the legal architecture of Reconstruction. In other case, after in case after case, the court failed to protect black people from terror, violence, and lynchings. While black men who try to vote risk being maimed and murdered, the court concerned itself with whether laws like the Enforcement Acts might fetter and degrade the state governments. The court's dismantling of Reconstruction was orchestrated by John Archibald Campbell, a white attorney and former Supreme Court justice who had voted with the majority in Dred Scott. Mr. Campbell, an enslaver, had left the bench in 18. In April 1861, they helped lead the Confederate States of America. After the Confederacy lost the Civil War, he bitterly opposed Reconstruction. In 1872, Mr. Campbell represented a group of white New Orleans butchers who claimed that efforts by Louisiana Reconstruction legislature to regulate their industry violated their 13th and 14th Amendment rights. They lost their appeal to the Supreme Court in 1873 slaughterhouse cases, but the ruling gave Mr. Campbell and other opponents of Reconstruction what they wanted. The court severely undercut the 14th Amendment by holding that citizenship rights were enforceable only in state courts, which were dominated by the white ruling class and utterly hostile to claims by black people in the South. That was tricky what they did. That was very clever. Demonically clever. What they did was they took the court, their case to court, the butchers, a group of butchers, a group of butchers took their case to court using the, what, 13th and 14th Amendment rights. The court rejected their case 
and basically said that each state had the right to enforce citizenship rights. <laughs> okay. Checkmate. <laughs> yeah, they did that. That that that's how sinister minds think. Ooh, God, they wanted so bad to keep black folks under their feet. And still do it, God. Let's go on. Let's continue. Leonard, nearly three years later, in another case that went before the Supreme Court, John Campbell represented white men who were participated in the 1873 massacre of an estimated 150 black people in Colfax, Louisiana. The bloodbath followed Louisiana's fiercely contested 1872 Goober national election where supporters of the white supremacist candidate refused to accept his defeat and set out to install their own local officials in Grant Parish. Black citizens surrounded the Grant Parish courthouse and other municipal buildings in Colfax to prevent the takeover. Hundreds of armed white men attacked the courthouse and killed an estimated 150 black people, many of whom had already surrendered. Three white men died. Unarmed black men, does that come to mind? Many black people surrendered and they still got killed unarmed black men and women get killed you hear what i'm saying let's go under the 1871 enforcement act federal prosecutors secured convictions of william j Krushak, a cotton planter who has served on the parish governing board and two other white men they appealed and the supreme court reversed the convictions ruling and crew Shack versus United States, the 14th, that the 14th Amendment prohibits a state, not individuals, from violating people's rights. Mr. Krushak and other perpetuators of the one of the bloodiest acts of racial terror during Reconstruction went unpunished. So it looks to me that the Supreme Court has been an enemy of black folks. Let's continue. Legal scholar Leonard Levy wrote that, in effect, shaped the Constitution to the advantage of the KKK. The decision eviscerated the Enforcement Act. The Justice Department dropped 179 Enforcement Act prosecutions in Mississippi alone. Emboldened white men no longer wore masks and increasingly carried out daylight attacks on black Americans. Soon after Dred Scott, descendants of the Scots and slavers purchased the Scott family and freed them. Mr. Scott found work as a porter at a St. Louis hotel. He told a local reporter and some of the few published words ever attributed to him that the long court fight had given him a heap of trouble, according to the anti-slavery bugle. If he had known it would take so long, Mrs. Scott said he would not have sued. He wished he could travel the country to tell who he is. But he died of tuberculosis in 1858. Before he turned 60, born and slave, Mrs. Scott lived for only 16 months as a free man. Harriet Scott, who worked as a laundress into her later years, died in 1876. She was 61. Roger Taney died in 1864. In 1865, Congress tried and failed to fund a bust of him to be placed in the Capitol along with those of his predecessors. Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts argued that a man who had done evil should not be complimented in marble. A few years later, as white attitudes about Reconstruction began to shift, Congress approved the bust of the late Chief Justice, and it was installed in the Capitol. Roger Taney's descendants, Charles Taney III, publicly apologized to Miss Jackson and to all black Americans for the terrible injustice of the Dred Scott decision. On its 160th anniversary, Miss Jackson hugged him. I don't know who Miss Jackson is, but I guess she felt compelled to relieve him.
him of how he felt about his ancestors. While individual justices too have condemned the decision, the Supreme Court has never officially apologized to Dred Scott has never officially apologized for Dred Scott. Um, as I was reading that, I saw very clear how the Supreme Court has not been a friend to black folks in this country. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's clearly evident who has been a friend and who hasn't. And as I say, black folks, and a lot of black people say to you, you have no allies. None in this country that you fought, built, and died in, and still dying in, and you have none around this world. And when you guys get it and realize that, maybe you'll take steps to do better. Because right now, you, you still thinking that you have a way that your strength alone is going to set you free and that's why you continue to be disappointed when we told you not to vote for these demonic democrats you did and now you got the whole country suffering because you was rebellious you kept giving these fools a chance and now they turn triple triple swords against you Slapping you all up in your face. Making you look stupid. Because you voted for him. Kept telling you don't vote for him. Don't vote for these Democrats. Go ahead. Vote Democrats down the line. We're going to vote for Biden. And now Biden just pissing in your face. And laughing as he does it. And then turn around giving the money that they, they take out of your taxes. To these immigrants who don't, these illegals who don't give a F about you or this country. Now how you like them apples? Thank you for your time, attention, and support. In whatever way you support this channel, we thank you from our hearts. I'm out. Have a good day. Peace. Peace.